The man at the altar, dressed like a god of maize, placed down the giant tooth with care. The body of his grandfather was wrapped and bundled in an elaborate burial shroud, and mouth filled with maize representing rebirth. The body was painted red with cinnabar, symbolizing death and resurrection. Because death was never the end for the Maya, it was a cyclical act of destruction and rebirth. Didn't make it hurt any less, the Mayans still feared death and the loss felt was uncomparable. We came from Maze and would be buried with it, and like the Maze god, would go to the afterlife and then be reborn, always in a cycle. Before they were laid to rest, they were given offerings, clay vessels, stingray spines, beads of jade like green stems, and a single tooth from a giant shark. The enamel had the same luster it had when the animal it belonged to died. A massive shark from a bygone age, now only alive by the stories the Maya told. It had come here from miles away, and now would be left with the dead. Maze to maze, ashes to ashes, bones to bones, and the dead would be reborn. The ocean is slowly rolling, distant waves roaring and drawing back out to sea, tides change as the moon drags gently on the sea. The sound of Catholic church bells told time, echoing far and wide over vineyards and rustic hillsides. The year is 1666. The air is beginning to chill from the warm summer months as autumn rolls lazily into medieval Italy. It was October when two fishermen from Tuscany caught a sea monster. It was a fully grown female white shark, a once in a lifetime catch. The locals were buzzing about the news. The Grand Duke of Tuscany, Ferdinando II de Medici, having heard word of the monster shark, ordered that its head be severed from the body and delivered further inland for dissection, study, and analysis by one of Italy's top anatomists in the interests of the betterment of science. It was sent to a man they called Nicholas Steno, an immigrant originally born in Copenhagen, Denmark, in 1638. He had moved to Italy that same year and had quickly been appointed as in-house physician for the Duke. Steno, or Niels Stenson, as he was known in Denmark, was a talented anatomist, and frequently drew ire from his contemporaries and colleagues for his stance against the classical status quo of medieval sciences, though even he wasn't perfect. And in line with his attitudes towards science, 
he never quite stood still. He completed medical studies from the University of Copenhagen, and then, in lieu of career opportunities for an anatomist in Denmark, traveled to Germany. He moved to Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where, as he visited and stayed with fellow physician Gerard Blaise, he dissected the head of a sheep, discovering the previously unknown duct for the parotoid salivary gland. Blaise, at first, dismissed the discovery outright, and later claimed the discovery as his own. Though we now call this structure the Stenson's duct, this early experience discouraged Steno from owning his discoveries. Later, he'd go on to discover more glands, more ducts. He'd make advances in the study of the brain and heart and muscles, each time upsetting commonly held beliefs about the natural world, from Galen to Descartes. He moved to Florence, and there he was appointed by the Grand Duke. The head of the shark was foul-smelling, reeked to high hell as fish often do. But in the end, it was an opportunity of a lifetime for a medieval anatomist. The dissection began in October, and probably completed by the end of the same year. In March of 1667, Steno and his co-author Axel Gabro published their treatise on the dissection, entitled Canis Cacariae Dissectum Caput, or The Dissection of the Head of a Dog Shark. Steno, though a physician by trade, was keenly fascinated by geology, and in his time studying scientific discussion of the recent past, there were certain things that stuck in his mind. As he carefully dissected the head of the great white before him, noting with deadly accuracy the arrangement of the muscles on the cartilaginous head and the numbers of teeth borne on each part of the jaw, he could not help but make comparisons between the teeth of the white shark and the strange stones which he knew as Glossopetra. It's dinner at the house of a French noble. The table is lined with a banquet of bread, wine, and meat. Standing before you on the table, however, lies what might be the most striking installation of silverware mankind has yet produced, and your host, always first to be the most humble, will not stop talking about it. It is called a langir, the snake tongue tree. It took the form of a small silver tree, ornate in structure to the point of absurdity, but any respected noble would not be caught dead without one. Dangling from each branch of the tree, this one decorated with figures from the Bible, was a glossopetra. You and the noble were both men of science, and so you took this time to digress into an argument over the origin of these oddities. The name was coined before the year 100, south of Tuscany, by a Roman general and naturalist, Pliny the Elder. He had professed that the objects fell from the sky during the lunar eclipse on moonless nights. The Duke prefers the common knowledge that these stones were naturally generating geologic structures, growing from within the earth. He tells you that the Glossopetra upon the tree are of the highest quality, having come directly from Malta. Everyone knew the most potent Glossopetra came from the soft white rocks of the island of Malta, because that was where St. Paul was bitten by an adder, survived, and banished snakes from the island, with these naturally occurring stones taking on the shape of his tongue, or of the adder's tongue, in honor of the deed. The banishment of poison. And for French royalty, only the most potent would suffice with their life on the line. The Languier had become such a staple of ceremony because of the purported abilities of the stones to detect poison in food and drink. The Sloan Lapidary, published nearly a century ago, claimed that in the presence of poison, the Glossopetra would sweat, while other sources claimed a change in color was the marker of a tainted meal. Glossopetra could even be ground up into powder and then used to neutralize poisons in drink. To this end, I cannot advocate for its efficacy. I did find one source claiming that calcium phosphate, a primary component of shark teeth, can be used to genuinely neutralize arsenic poison, so this may have had some large basis in reality over magic, though I cannot say the same for the purported miracle cure panacea that was powdered Glossopetra. A few decades ago, Italian naturalist Aldrovandi claimed the sweat was merely the result of exposure to the steam of the food, rather than to any poison. 
And still the Langir stayed in fashion until the 18th century, each stone dangling at the ready for someone to pluck it from the branch and dip it in their wine. But you doubted all those stories. You'd always thought the idea of Glossopetra spontaneously generating from the earth unbelievable, and as you cut through flesh and great white rot, you found what you needed. Steno was not the first naturalist to suppose the organic origin of fossils, though he was among the first to say outright that the Glossopetra, from the small to the gigantic, were the teeth of ancient long-dead sharks, alongside the early Fabio Colonna, who had deduced the similarity both by the similar appearance and by combustion. The burning of the Glossopetra revealed an internal structure identical to shark teeth, and also that the Glossopetra burned like modern shark teeth and unlike the rock that they were extracted from. Before his suggestion, around 1605, the first Glossopetra was illustrated among a variety of other shells and bones by Richard Verstegen. During 1602, one author had named six different varieties of Glossopetra and believed them to originate from the teeth of the modern lamnid sharks by some unknown process. In the century prior, authors before them had noted the striking similarities between Glossopetra and certain kinds of shark. Even Leonardo da Vinci, nearly two centuries ago, had posited that coral fossils and stony mollusk shells were organic in origin. It was not until some time around the first half of the 19th century that these suspicions would be accepted and confirmed in Europe, in contrast to the Mayans and native peoples of Mexico and Central America who'd known of the biological origin of the teeth for centuries. Louis Agassiz named it Carcarius Megalodon in 1835, before he corrected himself in 1843, assigning it to Carcarodon Megalodon, the same genus to which the modern Great White belongs to. Thus ensued an ongoing debate on the proper name of the Great Megatooth, on whether Megalodon is a species of Otidus shark, which also includes the famous fossil shark Otidus obliquus, or to Carcarocles, though the modern scale weighs heavily in favor of alliance with Otidus. While it may seem pedantic, understanding Megalodon within the wide context of the evolution of the Megatooth sharks is a goal worth attaining. Megalodon, just as we found out from the rocks centuries ago, did not spontaneously appear in the ocean. It is a part of a long line of megatooths. They split away from the ancestors of the great white shark before the end of the Cretaceous, from a shark called Cretolamna. And from there we trace a rough lineage of its forefathers. Otidus obliquus lived just after the dinosaurs, in the newly diversified oceans of the Paleocene, the dawn of the Cenozoic era which we currently find ourselves in. Then, from Otidus auriculatus, which ate other sharks and fish, lived alongside the first whales and became the first Otidus known to have a fully serrated tooth edge, and later Otidus augustidens living alongside the first baleen whales and becoming able to hunt them, we watch as the teeth get larger, the triangular boule on the back side of the tooth widening, and the auxiliary cusps on each side of the tooth becoming smaller. The root gets flat, and the serrations become smaller and more uniform. They were moving away from a morphology built for grabbing and tearing, to one built for cutting like knives. Nearly 28 million years ago, we start finding even larger teeth washed up on ancient beaches. The teeth are smaller and slightly more gracile in form than Megalodon proper, but still large enough to rip into the bellies of whales. There are hints of vestigial cusps on each side of the tooth, little more than bumps now. These teeth are from Otis Chubutensis, after the Argentine province of Chubut. At this point in the lineage, the line between Chubutensis and Megalodon is thin to none the two rather forming what Victor Perez and colleagues called a chrono-species complex. Chubutensis was not branching away from Megalodon, it was becoming Megalodon. As the cusp teeth become less and less common, Chubutensis-type teeth disappeared 7.6 million years ago, leaving Megalodon the sole megatooth on the planet.
Morning, off the coast of ancient Panama, Gatun Bay. A shallow sea no deeper than 50 meters, a hundred meters at most further out at sea, west of what is now the Atlantic open of the Panama Canal. But this is 10 million years ago. The sea is different, and the waters are warm, teeming with life, corals and fish of all different colors, birds eyeing them from above cautiously. But even then, sharks are not so quick to change. Most of the sharks here would still be recognizable today. Tiger sharks, bull sharks, duskies, silkies, hammerheads, sandbars, and Caribbean reef sharks. It's an ancient paradise with enough food to go around. Some sharks here, though, are lost to us. The wolverine shark Hemipristis sara stalked the shallows at up to seven meters long, a relative of the modern snaggletooth and one of the larger residents of Gatun, and a now extinct species of nurse shark to be found only very infrequently. Hemipristis sara and lemon sharks were the most common sharks found in this shallow sea, but scattered around the bay, just more common than the hammerheads, was a mid-sized shark, similar in appearance to a modern great white. But there are no great whites here. This is a young juvenile Otavis megalodon, scanning the reef for small fish. Even with giant wolverine sharks prowling the outer banks in search of sharks like our young megalodon to feed on, this may be the most peaceful time she will experience during her long life. Her life started with a struggle for survival. Her mother was relatively young, at around 25 years of age. She bred with a male off the coast of Colombia, and was pregnant for around two years, feeding mostly on whales. Just as do modern white sharks, Megalodon gave live birth. Her eggs hatched inside the womb, leaving the large, nearly meter-long young to continue developing inside. Within the womb, the fetal sharks competed with each other, cannibalizing unhatched eggs. Those that do survive are born large. The day our megalodon was born, she was more than two meters in length, and already a burgeoning apex predator. She was hardy because she was one of the victors. Before giving birth, her mother had traveled hundreds of kilometers to the place where she was born, Gatun Bay, Panama. This shallow sea was more than a paradise, it was a nursery. The food was abundant, yes, but primarily, year after year, mother megatooth sharks returned here to have their pups because it was a place where they could be mostly safe, with the exception of hemipristus and of rare transient adults who came here themselves to give birth or simply to take advantage of the highly productive hunting ground. Gatun Bay was a nursery because there were so few predators. Here our young megalodon was born, and learned to avoid wolverine sharks and learned to hunt in open ocean. She started on smaller fish and some turtles. Marine mammals here were rare and never large. Her countershaded body allowed her to avoid some encounters with predators. A darker dorsal and a light-colored ventral allowed her to blend in with the colors of the water when viewed from above and from below. The sides of her body are already marked with scars from combat, and there will be many more to come. Eventually, she must leave the shallows for the deeper waters of the Caribbean to hunt larger prey. As she aged, she became too large to maneuver in the shallows and was forced to migrate. She traveled north for hundreds of kilometers, reaching up as far as the Carolinas and meandering around the coastlines and into the depths of the Atlantic growing roughly 12 centimeters a year for decades. She learned to feed on whales larger than her. She bred with a male off the coast of Cuba and migrated south to the place of her birth. When she was 40, she gave birth to four pups, leaving them in Gatun Bay where they would be safe. And then she crossed the strait through the shallow Panama Sea to reach the Pacific. Here, a disparate population of megalodon hunted small whales, and competed for them against super carnivorous relatives of modern sperm whales. These were called Leviathan Melvilli, after the biblical serpent and the author of Moby Dick. Smaller than modern sperm whales, and with the same echolocating melon atop their heads, 
Leviathan had what might have been among the largest teeth any animal has ever possessed. They hunted alone, preying on the same smaller whales that Megalodon hunted off the coast, miniature baleen whales called cetatheres. While other shark species directly avoided areas more Megalodon hunted, Leviathan may have outcompeted Megalodon, or even hunted them in some cases, where they overlapped. Leviathan is only known from the southern hemisphere, with confirmed remains from Peru and Chile, while giant, isolated teeth, either belonging to or closely related to Leviathan, are known from across the global south. She did not spend long in the waters off Peru before she returned past Gatun to the Caribbean to continue to hunt for whales. After this, she lived for 56 more years in the Atlantic. Her total lifespan is now approaching a century. Over this time, she has seen nearly half of the Atlantic and explored parts of the Pacific. She has bred only a few times, and the fate of her pups is unknown to her. She is now nearly 18 meters long, each of her pectoral fins alone larger than an entire person, her teeth the size of a human hand. Over her life, as with all sharks, she has produced and dropped tens of thousands of teeth, growing them at the back of the gum before they are conveyor belted to the front of the mouth, one after another. The gum tissue begins to break away at the end of the conveyor belt, and before long, the tooth drops down to the ocean floor. Her teeth now litter the West Atlantic seabed, sometimes beside evidence of her kills. Her death came at the end, about as peacefully as a shark can go. They are solitary fish, and so when she began to lose her sight and started getting slower, she had a harder time hunting. She was no longer the apex predator she was when she was born in Gatun. Her body laid to rest off the coast of Cuba, a hundred years from Gatun Bay. This was the late Miocene. A few million years ago, Megalodon had reached their greatest abundance in their entire evolutionary history, spanning the Earth almost unrivaled in their power. Even with a lifespan of a hundred years or so, change came slowly. The seas, gradual as it might have been, started changing. As far as temperature went, nothing was terribly wrong. In fact, if the circumstances were different, Megalodon would have felt almost just as comfortable in the modern ocean as it was 10 million years ago. But their prey felt different. Megalodon sometimes followed their prey in migrations, but these were still mostly local. The whales never went far, they simply weren't as fast. The ancestor of the modern Great White, Carcardon Hubbleye, moved in where the Megalodon weren't, and they would switch places seasonally, avoiding each other to stave off unnecessary competition. But as the global temperatures shifted, the whales themselves changed. They started getting much larger, much faster, able to cross great distances to reach increasingly seasonal and even polar blooms of krill they fed on to survive. Megalodon was increasingly having a harder time hunting because it was stuck in the tropics. In the late Miocene, millions of years later, their territory extended to even larger swaths of ocean, their hunting ranges covering nearly 30 million square kilometers. But their populations were lower, they could not maintain the same abundance, not with such unreliable prey. And so their populations became less dense, even accounting for their greater territorial range. By the start of the Pliocene, roughly five million years ago, their territory had begun to shrink again, and their numbers steadily fell. The whales that Megalodon had evolved to feed on were gone, left in their place a choice between swift miniature cetaceans and giant dreadnought-like filter feeders. Neither option suited Megalodon well. Sea levels had dropped significantly. Somewhere in the savannas of Africa, a strange primate began to walk upright. Soon, entire megalodon populations were disappearing around the world, hunting ranges were fragmented, and megalodon were now competing for prey with the modern great white shark, Carcharodon carcarius. Gatun Bay was now long gone, dried and buried, and all that was left was teeth. 
other nurseries around the world started disappearing as well. From northeastern Spain to Bone Valley, Florida to the Chesapeake Bay. 3.6 million years ago, before man had developed the first stone tools and begun their great diaspora, the ocean was slowly rolling, and little remained at all. It was one of those days when they had run the engine. The large contraption sputtered and fought against the waves of the South Pacific, providing steam power to the enormous dredge on the side of the ship. The HMS Challenger has been utterly at sea since the middle of August 1875, when she departed Kilauea, taking a few weeks of rest over the small tropical island of Tahiti. It is now the 6th of October, near the Austral Islands. The nearest mainland, if you consider New Zealand to be as such, is nearly 4,000 kilometers west. The ship drags and creaks, and far, far below her, a large net plows to the silt of the abyss, tassels in front of it, stirring up the seafloor below. Light has not and may never reach this part of the ocean in its entire history, and yet, when the great dredge is finally reeled out of the inky depths to the world of the surface, objects are slowly sifted out of the mud seeing daylight for the first time in thousands of years. The dredge is full of red and chocolate-colored clay, and large slabs of hardened ash that once formed the seabed, a blanket of it up to an inch thick, originating from the nearby volcanic islands of Rutu and Tubai. Among the clays and slabs, the crew identifies the remains of ancient whales, usually ear bones, dozens of fossilized shark teeth, and chunks of manganese nodules. One of the crewmen of the Challenger reaches their hands in, pulling a giant four-inch long tooth loose from the muck. The tooth is broken, the root and most of the base of the tooth are missing or shattered away. More teeth are pulled from the mud, including a second giant tooth, also broken at the root. And both, like many of the objects the crew had dredged from the black before, were in part coated in a thin layer of magnesium dioxide. The teeth were rinsed and put in storage. The largest of these teeth belonged to Odotus Megalodon, and pulled from the abyss at a depth of 2,385 fathoms, more than four kilometers of water above them. I can't help but wonder what the crew of the Challenger thought as they pulled the tooth of a Megalodon loose from the abyssal sediment. The lead scientist of the expedition, Sir Charles Thompson, believed alongside other scientists of the time that the deep sea would reveal living biological artifacts of bygone era that certain missing links and living fossils would call the abyss home, so plastic in environment compared to the shallows that evolution would slow to a crawl, and the animals there would exist in near perpetuity. So what must have crossed their mind, holding in their hand the tooth of one of the largest sharks to ever live, fished from the lightless void? In 1915, one of the first true cryptozoologists by the name of Vladimir Chernesky studied these two teeth. He compared the thickness of the magnesium dioxide deposits to the published rates of deposition and found that the smaller of the teeth was apparently only a bit over 11,000 years old. He used these estimates to claim, for what might be the only time in published literature, that Megalodon existed until recent age, or even that it hadn't gone extinct at all. From this spurred dozens more claims and purported sightings of living Megalodon. Chernesky was wrong. The teeth really were far, far more ancient than he calculated. 
Better estimates for the rate of mineral deposition would place that number into the hundreds of thousands, and even that could not account for the time that the teeth had spent unexposed to the minerals, the time the teeth spent buried beneath heavy silt and ash hidden from the ages. The tooth had existed long enough, free of living owner, for the root to break off, fragment and disintegrate long before the magnesium began to grow on its surface. This was acknowledged as early as 1970, and a better age was given using the associated teeth, such as the great white ancestor Carcharodon hostilis, putting the animals alive roughly during the late Miocene or early Pliocene, as Megalodon entered its downfall. The last Megalodon that ever lived died more than three million years ago. Its prey was gone, and it could not survive in the oceans of the modern Ice Age. As global sea levels dropped, as water was frozen at the poles, the nurseries for its young disappeared as well, and as its hunting ranges fragmented and resources became even scarcer, they died. Of the millions or billions of teeth that a shark species would shed during their evolutionary lifetimes, no single tooth younger than 3.6 million years, from Argentina to Romania to Japan, has ever been recorded for Otodus megalodon. And yet, when a 9 foot long great white shark was recorded by its tracking tag being devoured by something much larger, plummeting to a depth of nearly 600 meters as the tracking tag passed through the digestive system, many were quick to blame a ghost. The narrative that Megalodon, in some form or another, managed to slip past the icy claws of death, evading extinction into our modern ocean and now hiding in the murk, was popularized in the 90s and traced back to a likely fabricated encounter with a giant shark in 1918 off the coast of Australia, while the idea of giant sharks may as well be thousands of years old. In this way, the Megalodon is a modern take on an old myth, or the same myth adorning itself with a semblance of scientific credibility, evoking a sense of reality while still surviving only on the unknown. In Steve Alton's 1997 fiction horror novel, now adapted into a summer blockbuster with an upcoming sequel, he describes an enormous male Megalodon rising from the deep, only to be ripped apart by cable, and showering its warm blood over the thermocline that had previously contained an even larger female, attracted by the thrashing and smell of blood, to the depths of the same famous Marianas Trench that the HMS Challenger discovered in 1875. Steve Alton described Megalodon erupting from the depths, becoming unextinct by re-entering the modern ocean after thousands or millions of years of absence, surviving and remaining elusive because of those great depths. The modern myth of the living Megalodon relies heavily on depths, in stories and in the minds of those who believe it. In lieu of physical evidence, the existence of a late surviving Megalodon population is entirely predicated on what we do not or cannot know. As John Copley wrote in 2014, whatever percentage explored given hardly covers the full story. This usually refers to mapping. At the time, Copley explained that mapping of the ocean occurs at different scales. At a 5 km resolution, we've mapped the entire ocean floor. At 100 meters, only about 15%. At the smallest reasonable scale of resolution, enough to discern objects only a few meters across, only around 0.05%, an area about as large as the island of Tasmania. But what does it matter? If we wanted to find Megalodon, that 95% unexplored figure is essentially meaningless. Megalodon died out primarily for climactic reasons, not enough prey and not enough shallows. Looking for it in the depths of the ocean will yield nothing. I could go over more arguments like how maybe Megalodon just shrunk really small and now great whites are actually Megalodon, or that Megalodons caused the bloop despite being presumably unable to generate audible vocalizations. But really, that would all garner about the same answer. Megalodon caught on camera and spotted in real life. They're absolutely huge, and each of their teeth are the size of a human being. This shark here looks a little too scrawny. 
to be a megalodon shark, but it may have been heavily malnourished when it was discovered. There's no denying that if it's real, it could most definitely be a megalodon. But that's the question, is it real? This clip comes from an Indonesian news network, and frustratingly, we can't find an English translation. It's hard to get a good look at what it's chomping down on, but it looks like it could be some kind of large water-based animal, or maybe even a boat. And we managed to capture this amazing beach from four different camera angles. So, if there is literally no evidence pointing towards a chance that Megalodon survived, even one that's thin to none, why is it still so popular? Well, simply put, it's just a nice thought, isn't it? Makes the world a bit more exciting, so do any cryptids. And when a mass of people want to believe something, then somebody, somewhere, sees that as a potential market. In 2013, Discovery Channel aired a new documentary to kick off their annual Shark Week, entitled Megalodon, The Monster Shark Lives. It carried itself, save for brief disclaimers added after the fact, as a factual investigation into a slew of shark attacks off the coast of Africa. It starred a fictional marine biologist named Colin Drake, searching for a giant shark. The documentary features various pieces of fabricated evidence, even citing the previously mentioned Challenger teeth, falsely stating that the teeth were carbon dated to 10,000 years, apparently not realizing it was dated by estimating manganese growth. Despite the admittedly vague and dodgy disclaimers, a survey conducted after the fact showed that after the show was over, more than 70% of viewers believed that Megalodon was still alive. It became Discovery Channel's highest rating program, raking in over 4.8 million viewers. Of course, next year they produced a sequel, Megalodon The New Evidence, once again presenting a new slew of evidence investigated by the very same Colin Drake, a cryptid with more evidence towards his existence than relic Megalodons do, presented as authoritative and factual, controversial in the eyes of the government and big science with a small disclaimer that some parts of it have been dramatized. In Michael Fuchs' 2020 paper on the subject, he noted that within the first 30 minutes of The Monster Shark Lives, the voice narrator repeatedly attempts to destroy the boundary which separates extinct Megalodon from its spectral, gothic, digital self, by first stressing the knowledge that it is extinct, using past tense to refer to Megalodon when discussing its ecology and form. And when the narrator explains that the consensus among the scientific community is that Megalodon is no longer alive, that it became extinct over two million years ago, he simultaneously acknowledges that Megalodon is extinct and begins questioning the consensus among the scientific community, thereby initiating a process which incrementally turns the scientific community into the program's villain the largely absent and anonymous establishment controlling knowledge and unwilling to accept the truth. While well, Discovery Channel would later claim, I mean, we're super cognizant of what happened. The last thing we want to do is cause ill will towards sharks, towards the brand, or anything like that. Yet, at the same time, we have a program we were proud of, so we wanted to own the fact that there were some controversy and that it was clearly a scripted program with actors in it. But then dive into the science of the show and the real fish. Both The Monster Shark Lives and The New Evidence both make attempts to cast extreme doubt on those that claim otherwise, pitting Colin Drake following the mad genius trope against the status quo versus the paid actors the program dresses as the establishment of science. The show relies heavily on audio-visual evidence, asking the audience whether they wish to trust consensus, or to trust what they can see in manufactured visual evidence they present to their own eyes. The prehistoric animal, long believed to have been extinct for thousands of years, hence invades the present, thereby collapsing the differences between past, the present, and the future. While the faux documentary seeks to upset the credibility and intentions of biologists in the minds of its viewers, it also employs another narrative device to convince the audience, one far more sinister in its intention. At multiple points during the program, the narrator and Colin provide climate change as a possible driver for the becoming unextinct of Megalodon. 
Has climate change pushed Megalodon out of hiding and into populated areas? Questions the narrator, while Colin Drake points to recent surges in extreme weather and geologic events as a driver for Megalodon's appearance. The documentary takes the digital unextinction of Megalodon as a way to present climate disaster not as a disaster to be stopped, but as a catalyst for biodiversity. The Anthropocene mutates into an age not defined by species loss and the impending end of various forms of life on the planet, but rather becomes synonymous with the discovery and even creation of new life forms, thanks to the wonders of modern technology. Though Megalodon went extinct because of climate change, the belief that it has somehow evaded extinction, surviving hidden in the modern ocean in nearly unchanged form, provides hope in some way that humans will be able to do the same. If Megalodon can overcome extinction, so can humankind. In the end, the meaning of Megalodon in the faux documentary hinges on what Ernst Becker called the basic fear that influences all others, a fear from which no one is immune no matter how disguised it may be, namely, the fear of death. In a somewhat strange twist, considering that the documentary opens with a megalodon most likely killing four people, the prehistoric shark survival against all odds endows humanity with symbolic immortality. Accordingly, the hypermediated present is not only haunted by megalodon's ghost of the past, but also humankind's ghost of the future. Oh yeah, that's good. Happy Shark Week.